electric trucks are finally hitting the market. And I'm lucky enough to be one of the few people that have ridden or driven all of the three most popular models coming to the US. I know which one is my favorite, but the question is, which one is right for you? Is there a true one truck to rule them all? And at the end, I'm gonna answer some of your questions you submitted online. Let's begin. To understand the truck market, we need to look a bit at the history of trucks in the US. First off, trucks aren't the most popular vehicle by type in the US. It's not even close. Well, okay, it's kind of close, but as a part of the US auto market, they're about half as popular as the crossover SUV segment. Hence why every automaker that's going electric is focusing on the CUV segment here in the US. But trucks are super popular here in the US, despite about 70% of truck owners never actually using their trucks for truck things. It's just one of the things that's synonymous with America at this point. You know, like baseball, hot dogs, and the best beer on the planet, obviously. And one aspect of truck ownership, at least in some states, looking at you here, Texas, has been hating on electric vehicles. It seems along with the truck nuts they give you when you buy your truck, you also get a guide on how to coal roll an electric vehicle. But I digress. Times are changing, however, and we now have three compelling electric trucks coming to the market and one that's already here. Now, something else compelling that we have to talk about as well is today's sponsor. Privacy.com is a great service that helps protect your banking information online by letting you create virtual cards for each different service or website you use, or even a different category of things you spend money on. You can monitor what's happening at a very fine grain level. You can also set up a card with a monthly limit, a total limit, or even just a one-time purchase if you like. Plus, if there's ever a data leak or any issue with your actual credit card and you get a new one with a new number, you can go change that out in one place on privacy.com and your virtual cards continue to work as normal. So if you wanna protect yourself online, go check out privacy.com at privacy.com slash Ben Sullins, and they're gonna hook you up with $5 to make your very first purchase after you sign up today. I've been using privacy.com for years now, and I'm happy to be partnering with them here to help you protect yourself online. So check them out again at privacy.com slash Ben Sullins. So let's start by looking at the two aspects we all focus on when comparing electric vehicles, price and range. For this comparison, I'm gonna choose the versions of the trucks that I think will be the most popular. So if you're wondering why I chose these specific ones, that's why. And yes, it's up for debate, but we have to draw the line somewhere. Okay, first up is the Ford F-150 Lightning. And the trim that I'm looking at here specifically is the Lariat Premium Edition, which includes the extended range battery. Now this is gonna retail right around $80,000. We'll call it 79.5. And we'll get you a reported 300 miles of range. Now, fun fact, the range is still not certified by the EPA. And when MKBHD was testing it, he said that Ford had told him that that was with a thousand pounds in the bed. Now, when I got to drive this, I asked that same question and I didn't get the same answer, but they're looking at 300 miles of range and they wanna make sure that whether or not you have something in the bed, you'll be able to get that, which means as most people don't actually have things in the bed when they're driving around in their trucks, even though, you know, why have a truck if you're not doing that? they should be getting much, much higher in range, but we'll stick with what they are telling us as of now, 300 miles. Now, next we have the Tesla Cybertruck. And for this one, I'm again looking at the one I think would be the most popular, and that is the tri-motor option, the highest end one, which comes in pretty affordably. It's $69,900, so we'll call it 70,000 even. And they say they're gonna get over 500 miles of range here. Now again, with the range, this is quite a ways out, so we'll see what it actually comes to be. In fact, you know, when Tesla said the Plaid Plus on the Model S was gonna get 520 miles of range or something like that, and then the Plaid came in at much, much lower, it's a question as to whether or not what the, what the real range will be. But we'll take them at their face value here, 500 miles versus 300 miles, although we know that those aren't gonna be the real world ranges, and of course, they're gonna be even more different just when they actually get certified by the EPA. And then we have the Rivian R1T, their flagship product, the first one. And this is the one that's actually in production already. People are already taking delivery, which is really cool. Now this is gonna run you about $73,000 for the top of the line package, not the launch edition one, but the one if you were to order it today. And that will get you around 314 miles of range. They do have another version with an extended battery pack, which we don't know about yet, that uh, will be a bit more expensive. But again, I don't think people are gonna really opt for that. So we're gonna leave that kind of out of our brains for now. 
And the main takeaway I see here from these numbers is that all three of these are really compelling in terms of range and price. Even in the high end, they really aren't too crazy for what you would pay for a luxury truck. If you think like a TRX from Ram or a Ford Raptor or something else, you're gonna be paying 80 plus thousand dollars already. So the fact that these all go a reasonable amount of range and you, you know probably gonna do better than what we think they're reporting, is all great news for this new segment that's really kind of being attacked by all the electric automakers out there. And that's all not even to mention that two of these three vehicles get this federal EV tax credit, which is likely to change. Who knows, it may be totally changed by the time you're watching this. But as of now, there's a $7,500 federal tax incentive for people to buy new electric vehicles. It's a credit on your next year's taxes, which reduces your tax liability. It's a bit more complicated than just saying, here's a check for 7,500 bucks. But if you wanna think of it as net cost, yeah, you definitely should include that. So with that, the price on the Ford and the Rivian drops by $7,500, the net cost, making them even more price competitive with other trucks in sort of this space. And then of course, some states like where I'm at in California and many other states have other local and state incentives. So all told, these are fairly affordable. Even if looking at these prices seems a bit high in this space, in the higher end truck space, and then when you throw in all the other incentives and things, these actually turn out to be pretty price competitive. Next up, we have performance slash utility. What is the function of it? How well does it perform? First up, the F-150 Lightning. We're looking at 563 horsepower with 775 pound-feet of torque. Pretty good, pretty impressive. That'll get you around zero to 60 in 4.5 seconds, mid fours, much faster than any of the other offerings out there in terms of the gas-powered versions of this truck. Now, this one has a five and a half foot bed, and they're saying 14.1 cubic feet of storage because they're only including the frunk. Now, the five and a half foot bed is a good size, and so if you were to cover that and lock it up, you would have a lot more room. And reportedly, this is gonna be able to tow around 10,000 pounds for this model, and likely there will be a heavier duty model down the road that could do more, but 10,000 pounds is where it's at right now. Then we have the Tesla Cybertruck Tri-Motor, and we don't have exact specs. The best I could find online, we're looking at about 690 horsepower and 824 pound-feet of torque, which will get you a zero to 60 time of 2.9 seconds, which is absolutely bananas, especially for such a big vehicle. This one, they say the Vault is a six and a half foot bed, and that combined with the frunk, which we don't know anything about, will get you 100 cubic feet of storage. That's a lot. And they said that this will be able to tow 14,000 pounds. Now the Rivian R1T is actually really interesting here because they are saying on their support website that the horsepower for the R1T will be 800 and the pound feet of torque will be 900. That is a lot more than even the tri-motor Tesla Cybertruck. Now, one thing about the Rivian R1T is that it actually has four motors. Every wheel has an independent motor, which in theory will allow you to do really cool things like tank turn. Now this, as they say, will get you a zero to 60 time in three seconds flat. And in my experience testing that, I don't know if I'd call it three seconds. We were with all terrain tires, all that kind of thing. It was quick, but Remember, these are utility vehicles, not sports cars, but it is fun to be able to do that in such a big vehicle like this. The Rivian has a shorter bed than the other ones. It's a four and a half feet, but with the tonneau cover, the power tonneau cover, which I was able to demo, plus the frunk, you're looking at 62 cubic feet of storage, which is really good. Now the towing for this comes in at just about 11,000 pounds. Again, three solid option when it comes to performance and utility, which I think will win over a lot of existing truck owners out there. Next, we have the tech. And this isn't as objective as a comparison as the other one, since we're not just talking about a specific number that's measured in a consistent way. So what I wanna talk about are just kind of the most compelling tech aspects of each vehicle based on my experience with them. So first up, the ADOS system, the Advanced Driver Assist system. So with the Ford F-150 Lightning, it will have what they call Blue Cruise. I have not tested this in the Lightning. I have tested it in the Ford Mach-E. And during the sections of the highway where it was able to be used, because it is geofenced, it worked great. And I was actually really impressed by it. Then of course, in the Tesla world, we have Autopilot, as everyone knows about, which is, I still think, the best one out there. But, you know, in terms of the basic functions of it, works great. I've been using it for years. It'll keep you in your lane in terms of turning with traffic, and it'll speed up and slow down. And then when it comes to Rivian's ADOS, which is called Driver Plus, I did get a chance to test that on my drive from Denver to Breckenridge, where I spent uh, two and a half days with the vehicle itself. 
And again, it worked great. Now they are not really pushing so hard to make it completely autonomous and all that. They think of it as more of a convenience factor, right? It'll just make driving a little bit less stressful, a little bit easier. My guess is that as that problem gets solved by folks like Tesla and Waymo and others that are really pushing really you know, bleeding edge stuff, trying to make it a reality, they can just license that and bring it in. There's a lot of hardware here to make it possible. But as of now, I would say they all are fairly similar with Tesla, of course, having the big you know asterisks there about full self-driving and what features may be available when it comes out versus when you know the other ones are already what they're doing today. Next, you have kind of the interior screens and layout. This is the thing that I think is important because when we get in a car, I feel like it's a big deal, like how it feels when you sit down. This to me is why I still love the Model S and X over the three and the Y, because when I get in, I feel like, wow, this is nice. This is tech, there's all this stuff. And the other ones are so minimal to me, I just, I, I feel underwhelmed by it. So with the F-150, I got to spend, you know, a couple hours with it, sitting in it, doing all that stuff. It felt exactly like an F-150, what has all the bells and whistles and buttons and knobs that a typical F-150 it does with the addition of this 15 inch portrait mode touchscreen. I personally really like it. Uh, the little knob on the bottom is a little quirky. I'm not sure that's necessary. The software could definitely be improved, but overall it feels tech and modern. I definitely step up from the traditional you know, gas version of this vehicle. Then when it comes to the Cybertruck, this is where, again, it goes towards that minimalistic Model 3, Model Y interior where there's nothing but the screen and they have this uh, yoke steering wheel. I don't know if that's really what it'll come out with. I hope not. But I don't like this at all. I mean, I've driven my Model 3 and my wife's Model Y for a long time. It's not something that I personally enjoy. I think that you're trying to cram too much stuff in one screen. A second screen behind the wheel could really alleviate a lot of that pressure and still give it a really clean look, which is basically what you see in the Mustang Mach-E, which is why I like that interior so much. So. Cybertruck, not a fan of the interior and the layout. It's just too minimalistic. I think they could do some really cool stuff there, but you know, we'll see what it looks like when it actually gets made and is ready for production. Then you have Rivian, which I really like the interior of this. It really feels as though this is designed by the same people that designed Tesla's products. I mean, the screens are beautiful and clean and they're laid out and kind of embedded in there in this really nice wood decor. The steering wheel has got some good clicky buttons, which are nice, and they're not super cluttery and confusing like the F-150 is, if you've never, you know, have driven an F-150 before. So the Rivian interior to me is the nicest one. The, the tech, it's really clean, it's really nice. The only complaint I have with it is the same one I had with the Model 3 and Model Y, which is to change the with direction of the air vents, you have to go into software and menus for that, which I hate. Overall, I think the Rivian interior and the tech in it is probably my favorite where it feels really modern and really tech forward, but not like you're losing functionality, not like you're you know diminished in what you're able to do, which is definitely how I feel in the Tesla Cybertruck. Then when it comes to software, looking at the F-150, they are definitely playing catch up here. They are doing the right things in terms of they have a team dedicated to making this and they wrote the software from scratch and they're building it and kind of improving it with over the air updates, like just like every other automaker here. But it definitely needs some work. You know, some of the graphics and some of the things aren't my favorite. They're not the most intuitive, but it's not bad by any means. I would definitely give it, you know, a six or seven out of 10 here in terms of the rating of the software as it stands today. Some of the cool things that they actually have, and this is the Mach-E and the Ford Lightning, the F-150 Lightning, is all how the cameras all work. You have the 360 degree views, you have the side monitoring. There's actually quite a bit of very functional bits of the software, which I'm surprised Tesla doesn't have. But you know, overall, I would say the general look and feel of it has promise, but it's still the early days for Ford. Then when it comes to Tesla, in the Cybertruck, we actually saw an entirely different user interface than you see in the Model 3 and Model Y, which would be the more comparable ones because of the layout of the screen and everything. I actually really liked the UI. It seemed clean. I liked the difference in the graphics. It's kind of cool, very Cybertruck looking. It's a bit more futuristic than say, you know, the typical one you're used to if you drive a Model 3 or Model Y. But of course, the only challenge I have there is the fact that you only have one screen to deal with. So you're just trying to cram everything in that UI into one relatively small space. Not to say it can't be done, but you know, I think there's some work to be done there. But overall, the responsiveness, the quality of the software really is second to none. Then when it comes to Rivian, 
The software felt so similar to Tesla. It really did in so many ways, from the driving visualizations to how the menus were laid out in the screens. I would say they're you know pretty close to Tesla in terms of how it all looks and feels and where the buttons are and when you click on them, you know the, how intuitive it is and all that. But obviously they're not quite there yet. They're brand, brand new. So they've got some work to do, but definitely a really strong effort coming out of the gate from Rivian. Now for the last category, before we talk about some of the more key questions, styling, the most subjective one of them all. Well, the F-150 Lightning looks exactly like an F-150. Besides the full bar headlight and taillight, it is almost identical to another F-150 of the same year. And that I think is a benefit. It's, it's actually a feature for them. It's if you're looking for something different, no, this isn't it, but that's not who they're selling it to. So may not be my favorite. I do think it looks decent. It doesn't look crazy or weird or anything else. It looks better than a regular F-150, but it's not my take, right? And, and again, I'm not the typical F-150 owner. So, but they're again, hitting their mark for their customer base, which is why I'm so excited about that vehicle. Then when it comes to the Cybertruck, things get a little weird. You know, you have to admit, this is odd. I remember being at the event when they had the truck come out and everyone just looked around and thought it was a joke, like it was gonna fall away or a curtain was gonna happen and a new truck was gonna come out. That may still happen. There, there are still rumors out there that Tesla secretly has been working on a, on a real truck, you know, more traditional truck, you may call it, whatever, in, in, in the background while the Cybertruck has kind of been taking away all, all the spotlight there. But we'll, you know, let's not speculate on that. The styling of the Cybertruck is uh, interesting, controversial. I don't know what to say. I don't like it at all. I think it looks insane. And that is the main reason why I would never buy one of these things. It is insane. Now, the third one though, the Rivian, is an interesting compromise. To me, the Rivian looks modern and futuristic and it's definitely an eye turner. As you drive down the road, you get a lot of people saying, hey, what is that? That looks different. It looks cool. It looks familiar, but new. And so, I really like the look of the Rivian, I really do. Now, you know, pictures and on video online tell one story, seeing it in person is a different animal altogether. The only thing I'm not a huge fan of is the pig nose in the front. And I've said it many times, even from the day I first saw it at the unveiling, but it's a good looking truck, I think in every other angle there. And it does grow on you a little bit, the little pig nose there, but again, with the full bar headlight, which is kind of cool. I didn't get to see this, but apparently as it's charging that full bar kind of tells you how the level of charge and all that. So it's more functional than that. I think it's a good looking truck overall. It has some really cool features and I think a lot of people are gonna like it, but it's the most subjective category. So obviously tell me what you think down in the comments. All right, back to the original question. Which one is right for you? Well, I don't know everything about you yet, but here's how I see them breaking down. The F-150 is the utilitarian here. Its tried and true design will appeal to millions of F-150 owners out there and bring tons of new people into the EV movement. If you drive a truck for work, this is gonna be your choice. The Rivian, on the other hand, is the fun California adventure truck. If you like going out to the desert and ripping around on dirt bikes or camping up in the mountains, but also need to fit your three kids in the back as a daily driver, this is your truck. And if you're a technophile that wants a lot of attention as you drive down the road and wants a flashy vehicle and you want something with absolutely insane performance, well, the Cybertruck is your choice. The great thing here is that as far as I see it, each of these vehicles have a fairly distinct buyer profile. And this brings up another key question. When can you get these? When will they actually be able to be delivered to you? Well, the Rivian is already in production as of today, but they only have about 50,000 pre-orders. What that means is that if you were to put your order in right now, my guess is that you would get your truck either late 2022 or early 2023. Now, that's good, but hopefully they'll be able to ramp up and get to that even sooner because I think there is a lot of demand for the R1T. Now the F-150 will reportedly be in volume production in spring of 2022, and Ford already has over 150,000 pre-orders. So if you put down an order today, you could possibly get it in 2022, but more likely early 2023. And with Tesla, there hasn't been a ton of clear communication here, especially since they canned their PR team. But the best I could find is that they're hoping for first production in late 2022 with volume production sometime in 2023. 
Now, in order to achieve that, they first need to finish the Texas Gigafactory, and I was just there, and it definitely looks like still a big work in progress. Then they have to start building the Model Y from there, according to Elon, before they start making the Cybertruck. So given Tesla's history of being late with their estimates and they reportedly 1 million pre-orders for Cybertruck, my guess is that if you put your order in today, you'd be looking at 2024 at the earliest. And that's only for the most expensive version, which they always deliver before the more affordable options. So if you wanted one of those, 2025, 2026, somewhere around there. But the electric trucks are coming and they're coming in strong, hopefully with enough torque to bring over the most staunch EV holdouts. And if it works, then each one of these vehicles will greatly help the EV movement and the adoption curve that we're trying to cross that chasm in. Now, for your questions. Okay, this one comes from Creative Isolation. Simply, if you weren't a YouTuber who creates videos about them, which would you purchase for your family and why? Well, one bit of context, I have two kids uh, that are young that are in child seats and I live in Southern California. So those two bits about it. I don't really need a truck that much, right? It's, it's more recreational. I'm not really hauling stuff. We have a trailer for my wife's Model Y that we use for home renovations and the things we do need. But in terms of a daily driver, I don't need the most utilitarian version. So F-150 would not be it. Cybertruck, as I mentioned, the looks are so off-putting, I could not imagine ever having that as my daily driver. Not a chance. Also, it's really big, so it's not something that I would be comfortable driving here. So for me, the easy answer, the Rivian is absolutely the one I would go with for me and my family, given you know my situation here. I got a couple different questions here from folks asking about getting in and out of the vehicles. The Cybertruck was, I think, the tallest one of them all, so that would, I guess, be the hardest one to get in and out of. The F-150, I remember there was a little thing where I set the camera in and I just hopped in, and it was actually probably the easiest to get in and out of. And Rivian was, yeah, it's taller than, you know, just a regular car, but it felt a really easy to get in and out of. It wasn't overly tall or anything like that. Although, you know, the Cybertruck, it was so long ago, it's hard to say how difficult that was. So getting in and out of them, I don't think that any of them were incredibly difficult. If I were to say which one was the easiest to get in and out of, it would have to be the F-150. Okay, there's a couple questions here around charging, specifically around visiting the Great Basin uh, National Park. Now, this is something that Rivian is doing with their Rivian Adventure Network. It's a series of high-speed chargers that are gonna be placed at national parks and kind of these off-the-beaten-path areas where you wanna go adventure and there may not be any charging infrastructure that exists today. So I really like that. Obviously, if one had a clear advantage in the charging space, it would have to be Tesla because of the supercharger network. But, you know, they're all doing kind of cool things. Ford is probably the one that's the gonna be behind everyone else on this because to my knowledge, they're not building their own network. They are leveraging Electrify America and all these other kind of combinations of them with their Ford Pass app. They'll tell you that they have the largest charging network, whatever. It's like back when cell phone companies would try to say that. Maybe they still do, you know, the fastest, the best, the, the largest, whatever. Ever. Really, no one can touch Tesla when it comes to the supercharger network. It's not even close. Rivian is doing cool things, so if you specifically wanted to go camping or do a national park, they would be the ones that might have an advantage there. But if you use apps like PlugShare and look around where you want to go, you'd probably be surprised to find there are chargers all over here in the U.S. Jennifer Montgomery asks, which one would you recommend most for camping in? obviously the R1T, that's what it's built for. I didn't talk about the quirks and features of these vehicles, but some of the cool things they have is the Rivian has like the camping speaker that pops out, they have lights everywhere, they have outlets that you can use, as well as they have a kitchen that you can even get to cook all of your meals on. And when I was up there for a couple days with them, out, you know, we're not camping, but we were uh, basically up in the mountains doing, you know, camping-like things. Yeah, it was, uh, we used it for that as well. So I would say Rivian is easily the best one to go camping in. Greg, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name here, Uter, Uter Molen. See, I said I wasn't going to, then I did it. You're welcome. Asks about the quality of the vegan leather seats inside of the R1T. They felt good. I don't have any, you know, I'm not a big interior materials guy, but I would say that they probably felt better than the than the Ford did, but, you know, the Cybertruck was basically using the same seats as the Model 3, so... They, none of them were bad. None of them felt plasticky or weird or anything like that. I definitely, the quality of the materials and everything in the Rivian did stand out to me. The F-150, it you know was a utilitarian vehicle. I was in the Platinum one, so it had some of the higher end finishes and stuff like that. But it, to me, just felt more like, oh, this is what I would expect. The Rivian felt high quality to me. And the Cybertruck, we'll see what it even looks like when it comes out. I mean, Tesla... 
in, in the materials they chose for the Cybertruck, the one I drove in, were not impressive in any way, right? I think the old Model S and Model X were much better. If you look at the Model S and Model X now, they're obviously way better than the Model 3 and Model Y. So, you know, I wouldn't say it was on par with those, but, you know, none of them really felt bad or weird to me. So I think they all were, were fine or, you know, better than that by a little bit. ENP asks, did you get any info on charging curves and real world range? Uh, not really. Unfortunately, I didn't get to charge the Rivian. I talked to one of the engineers there and he said it's they're hoping to get around 220 kilowatts for the top speed that may improve over time. Obviously, Tesla, we know, is great about these things. I would be not surprised at all if it was you know, uh, industry best in, in charging and all those kind of things. And the Ford, it is going to go, I believe, up to 150 kilowatts, which is good. But again, you're going to have to find an EA charger that works, which we've seen so many problems out there. It's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. But really, you know, the only time you're really concerned about this is if you're on a road trip. And so there, going on road trips, Tesla's going to win this kind of conversation every time. It's, they're they're going to stand so far uh, above everyone else. So, you know, Overall, I think they can all charge very well in a normal use case, but in that use case, Tesla's gonna win that battle for sure. George P asks, can a true truck person from say the Midwest be convinced to get into the Bev truck bandwagon? I hope so, but probably not by the Cybertruck or the Rivian. Maybe the Rivian, if you're in sort of a adventure Midwest town, I don't know what that would be. I'll leave you for the comment section to, to answer that question. But the F-150 is the, the winner in this category, right? And this is why I'm so excited about the F-150, not because I love F-150s or love Ford for any reason, it's that mainstream truck buyers will love this. And that is super important. We can't ask people to go from something they've been you know familiar with driving for generations now to a cyber truck. They're just not gonna do it. It's just not gonna happen. So. You know, the F-150, I think, is is the winner there when it comes to trying to actually convert people over to the electric space that maybe are just coming from a traditional, you know, truck buying family. Ryan Platt, Ryan Platt asks, if you had to name one of the three vaporware, which one would it be? None of them. These are all real vehicles. I've ridden in all of them, you know, driven them, whatever. They're in production, coming to production. They're all real vehicles from real companies. Nikola, different story. Go check out them if you haven't heard, if you want to learn about vaporware and how that whole thing. And I would just, I would kind of parlay the Nikola vaporware conversation into basically anyone pushing hydrogen for passenger vehicles. I have to do a video about this someday, but anytime I see the mention of hydrogen for a vehicle me and you would buy, you just, red flags everywhere. I mean, this was basically disproved in the late 90s. It just is not gonna happen. So anytime you see that, anybody mentioning, oh, what about hydrogen? Nope, you exit the conversation because you're just going nowhere. It's going down into some scammy, fraudulent vaporware kind of place. So that's all the questions here. Thank you guys for submitting those. I just wanna leave one last thought is that the EV movement is still in the very early days. We're in the infancy of this. This year in the US, we saw a report today, we're gonna get maybe close to 4% of sales. That's, that's still nothing. You know, it's still as, as big as Tesla is in terms of valuation, you know, they just passed a trillion dollars and all this kind of thing. It, it's still the actual number of vehicles being sold that are electric is tiny. And that needs to change, which is why I, as well as all the other EV advocates out there are so excited when we see these companies doing things that are really helping kind of push us forward in that. So the F-150 Lightning, the VW ID4, things like that, where it's like introducing electric to people that otherwise may not have ever wanted to go there. So I hope you're on board with this. If you are, you know, leave me a like. If you're not, if you don't want the EV movement to succeed, go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, click the like button twice, you know, to, to let, it, let you two know you didn't like that idea. So that's it for this one, guys. I'd love to know your thoughts on this whole thing down in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you back here in the next one.